My name is Lou Brown, and I'm the director of the Forum for Scholars and Publics at the John Hunt Franklin Humanities Institute. I welcome you today to this first program in our four-part series, Contemporary Conversations in Christianity. The series has been developed by Elizabeth Schrader Pulzer, doctoral candidate in the graduate program in religion at Duke, and this year's Ann Fuhrer Scott Public Scholars Fellow. The series purposely highlights a broad array of perspectives on Christianity, inviting public scholars from the Episcopal, Baptist, Hindu, and Catholic traditions, each of whom are some of the most respected voices in their field. The goal is to bring private conversations about Christianity to the surface in order to discuss them in community. We're thrilled to be supporting the series. We also want to thank our co-sponsors for today's discussion, the Office of Student Affairs, the Graduate Student Council Alumni Engagement Fund, and the Graduate Program in Religion. I also want to invite you to join us after today's discussion for this beautiful weather. We have a light reception on the patio opposite the chapel entrance out there. So now to introduce our speakers today. Our host is Elizabeth Schrader Pulzer. As a doctoral student at Duke, her research interests include textual criticism, the New Testament Gospels, the Nag Hammadi Corpus, and Mary Magdalene. She holds an MA and an STM from the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church. Her work has been published in the Harvard Theological Review, the Journal of Biblical Literature, and TC, a journal of biblical textual criticism. Her research has been featured by the National Catholic Reporter, Christian Century, Religion News Service, and the Daily Beast. She'll be in conversation today with our very special guest, Dr. Diana Butler Bass. Dr. Bass is an award-winning author, popular speaker, inspiring preacher, and one of America's most trusted commentators on religion and contemporary spirituality. She holds a doctorate in religious studies from Duke and is the author of 11 books. Her bylines include the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN.com, Atlantic.com, USA Today, Huffington Post, Spirituality and Health, Reader's Digest, Christian Century, and Sojourners. She's commented on religion, politics, and culture in a wide variety of national and global media outlets. Her work has received numerous awards, including two Wilbur Awards for Best Nonfiction Book of the Year, awards from Religious News Association for Individual Commentary and for Book of the Year, Nautilus Awards Silver and Gold Medals, the Illumination Book Awards Silver Medal, Books for a Better Life Award, Book of the Year of the Academy of Parish Clergy, the Frank S. and Elizabeth D. Brewer Prize for Church History, Substack Fellowship for Independent Writers, and Publishers Weekly's Best Religion Book of the Year. We're honored to have Dr. Bass with us, and we look forward to today's conversation. I'll now turn it over to Elizabeth Schrader Poulter to lead the way. Very much, thank you, Lou, and thank you very much to the Forum for Scholars and Publics for allowing me to dream up this speaker series, which is really just me talking to people that I like, people that I want to have conversations with, and having those conversations in public. So um, Diana is a good friend, and I'm thrilled that she was willing to come down to Durham and have this conversation. And I was saying, okay, well, Diana, what should we talk about? And at first we were thinking Christianity and politics. And I'm like, I don't know how good I would be at that, because I live in early Christianity. We have very different, we have very different realms that we work in. I don't really do much past the fifth century. And so I'm like, eh, I don't spend as much time in that world. But one thing that we are both interested in is Christianity and its future. So that's what this conversation is about. And it turns out, just by sheer luck, that we had planned this a couple of months ago, and it turns out that just a few weeks ago, there was a Pew report that came out specifically about the future of Christianity. Is anybody in the room aware of that report? A few people are, yeah. And so that's actually a perfect launching place um, I do want to talk about Diana's books as well and what interests me about what she writes about. But first, because Diana is such a specialist and such an expert on American Christianity, I thought that, um, and this is Diana's suggestion that we would talk about this, about this Pew report that came out. So it has this modeling of what's going on in Christianity. Um, you can see what's happening with people who identify as Christians. That's the red line at the top. And then there's the people who identify as none. It's not the people who wear the habits. That's not the ladies in the Catholic Church, not those kinds of nuns. These are N-O-N-E, nuns, people who do not have a religion, um, or they're religiously unaffiliated, I should say. And you can see that there is the rise of the nuns 
that is happening simultaneously with the sort of decline of people who identify as Christian. And um, this, from the Pew Report, this one quote sort of stood out to me. Once Christians began to lose their overwhelming majority, people of all ages who had ties to Christianity but did not attend church, they may have begun to identify as unaffiliated in larger numbers. As these nuns grew in size and visibility, becoming unaffiliated may have become more socially acceptable in some circles, which opens the floodgates to further disaffiliation. And there was those floodgates there in front of you, and here is the modeling. Can you talk to us a little bit about this modeling that Pew did for the future of Christianity? Yeah, you know, it's... Um really interesting to be here and to talk about these slides because when I was a graduate student in the late 80s and the early 90s, my work was exclusively on American Protestantism, particularly the past of American evangelicalism. So I worked with then George Marsden, who was here for about seven years as a professor of American religion. And I sort of thought that my whole career would wind up being, you know, in some august academic institution talking about 19th century religion for the rest of my life. But one of the odd things that happens, I think, to a lot of people who study American religion is that people begin to ask you the question, um, okay, well, that happened, and okay, that, you know, interesting enough, um, but what's going to happen next? And people started asking me about the future of Christianity. So, so my training 35 years ago would have said something to the effect that Protestantism will continue to be um, the majority tradition of religion in America. There will be an increase of religious diversity. Um, there will probably be some level of racial uh, diversity that spreads through um, American Protestantism. But we expected the shape of American Protestantism or American religion to stay largely Protestant with a large major, a minority of Catholics and then other diverse world religions in somewhat larger numbers than they had been in the past. The reason I recite that is that no one who was walking these halls those years ago teaching any class that I ever heard of expected this picture. Mm. I, this is a complete outlier to everything that people in my field anticipated two or three decades ago. So over the years, as folks have asked me about the future of Christianity in America, I had learned to pay more and more attention to what was going on with sociology of religion. So it, this is not my training. I am not a sociologist. I'm an American religious historian. Um, but through experience, have learned to read this kind of data. And there are a whole bunch of people who are sociologists of religion who send me data in advance because they just know that I'm really interested about it. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this Pew report, it was sort of fascinating. They, they draw this from data they have collected. And Pew has an, a huge data set on American religion. And they've also drawn it from general social survey data. It, you can see basically what they've created here is a hundred year chart. Uh, they start it in 1972 and they push it theoretically out to 2070 uh, with where we are right now, basically right in the middle of the page. And so what they have done is something that people in business and uh, Wall Street and other sorts of fields do, is they've created four probable futures based on the data they already have about birth rates, death rates, adherence rates, um, switching rates, and projected out these four potential scenarios of what will be the percentage of the population 50 years from now that will still be Christian. And that's throwing everybody in the same bucket. So when they say Christianity in America, they're talking Catholic, Orthodox, Pentecostal, Black, White, Brown, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, 
everybody who could potentially fit in a Christian category. They've plugged into that one category. There is only one model um, where 50 years from now, Christianity is still the majority tradition, and that would be 54% of the population uh, being Christian, and all the rest of the models show Christianity being a uh, minority uh, tradition in a much more pluralistic uh, circumstance. And Pew itself says the top model, the 54% model, is the least likely scenario, and that they think probably the third model, where it says 39% of the population will be Christian in 2070. Um, Pew thinks that's the most probable. So this is uh, where it's pointing us. And like I said, this is not what anyone had imagined would happen. And so right now there are tons and tons of arguments about, well, how did this happen? Uh, what does it mean? What's the future of religion? And uh, there are lots of, let's just say, kind of theological and academic horses in that race. And there are lots of people who want to be proved right um, for their opinion about what caused this. And frankly, a lot of people think about what would it mean to stop it um, from happening. Mm. They would like this to be a bad model. And so, so it's a really interesting, contentious question um, about Christianity in the future. So, Thank you for that. Um, so as we were talking about this, I, I think probably some people in here have read Diana's book, Christianity After Religion. It's one of her best-known books. And this book was written in 2012, so 10 years ago. And it talks a lot about Christianity and its future. But it's written from, a, a, it's interesting because both you're both very hopeful in 2012, but you also predict some things that could happen, which did end up, which actually ended up happening. This is why Diana is such an in-demand. She basically had a prophetic voice in 2012, where she predicted some of the things that did end up happening. So one of the things that I'm you... I'm not so crazy about the, the Donald Trump. Well, <laughs> right. She says, well, there is, there is this nativist backlash that sometimes happens, but she's like, but it's, it's, it's going to be a hopeful world. So she does kind of warn that it may happen, and then it, it does happen. There is... So, so um, basically, in this book, one of the things that I was most interested in, we talk a lot about... Um, this concept of awakening. You talk a lot in the book about this concept of awakening, and apparently there have been three great awakenings in American religious history, which probably most American religious historians know, but people who work in the fifth century and before don't necessarily know that. But I was glad to learn about that. And in 2012, you were talking about how we were on the cusp of a possible fourth great awakening. And one of the people who talked about this, and when I read this, it's William McLaughlin, who wrote in 1978. And when I read this passage in his book, which um, Diana highlights in her book, my heart just sang. I was like, well, yeah, that's, that's what I would hope would happen. This is what McLaughlin writes. He talks about this possible fourth great awakening that he saw was maybe going to happen. Such a reorientation will most likely include a new sense of the mystical unity of all mankind, uh, humankind, we would say today, and of the vital power of harmony between humanity and nature. The Godhead will be defined in less dualistic terms. Its power will be understood less in terms of an absolutist, sin-hating, death-dealing, almighty Father in heaven. More in terms of a life-supporting, nurturing, empathetic, easygoing, parental, motherly, as well as fatherly image. The nourishing spirit of Mother Earth, not the wrath of an angry father above, will dominate religious thought. That sounds nice. Um, sacrifice of self will replace self-aggrandizement as a definition of virtue. Helping others will replace competitiveness as virtue. Institutions will be organized for the fulfillment of individual needs by means of cooperative communal efforts rather than through the isolated nuclear family. When I read that, I was like, wow, that sounds good. That sounds amazing. And um, basically in the book you say, he predicted that this might happen, but then what happened? 
Well, this William McLaughlin book, it's important to know that McLaughlin was one of the great sorts of deans of American religious history in the late 20th century. He taught at Brown University and was exceedingly well regarded. I think he was the president of the American Society of Church History at least once, and uh, was participating in AAR and all the stuff, you know. And um, you can see here on the slide that Revivals, Awakenings, and Reforms was written in 1978. And so he was looking out over his world of American religion, and he was seeing all of these interesting changes around um, how people gathered, uh, what ethical issues were coming to the fore, and was speculating um, about the changes uh, in American religion. And so very optimistically, so if you think this book was published in 78, it was published by University of Chicago Press. Um, he was probably writing it in 76 and early 77 to get it out in 78. So Jimmy Carter uh, was president. Um, he saw Carter as quite an important religious uh, figure as well as political figure. Um, he was interested in, uh, McLaughlin talked a lot about religious uh, change related to spirituality and spiritual practices, was beginning to see in 78 a decline of traditional religious institutions in favor of creating different sorts of communities and integrating into those communities spiritual practices from Eastern religion. Yeah. Yes, it's a really interesting little book. As a matter of fact, when uh, I first read it, it was here, um, George Marsden assigned this book uh, for a class in 1987 that was his History of American Evangelicalism class. Uh, somewhere in some file, there's probably a copy of the of my reaction to this book. We had to write book reviews of all the books we read in class. And when I read this book as a student here, I hated it so much that I literally <laughs> threw my copy against the wall and I wrote a, tr uh, I wrote a review that absolutely trashed it. Um, <laughs> And uh, I remember having a huge argument in class with one of my classmates who was much more, uh, at that point in time, much more theologically liberal than I was. And it almost came to blows <laughs> in the classroom. Uh, but I returned to this book later on because I was thinking about change in the first decade of the 21st century. And I was trying to recall uh, books that had talked about the changes that we were really beginning to see. And I looked up on my shelf and my eye fell on this book. I picked it up, opened it, and that was the first paragraph that hit my, you know, sort of came to my attention. And I went, oh my gosh, McLaughlin was really onto something. And so I went back and I reread the book. And it's, an, it's a quirky book. And I'm sure that other people will have the same response to it in some ways that I do. In an academic setting, you are on shaky ground when you try to write a book that claims that certain patterns in history absolutely repeat themselves. And yet here was McLaughlin um, at Brown University doing that very thing. And so I was you know, sort of willing to get hit, give him uh, some leeway here. And what I think he, he does do is, it's not that you can expect necessarily an awakening every so often or it happens on some sort of mysterious time schedule that's held by the divine timekeeper in heaven. Um, but what he says is that Religion is involved in social change in America. And the times of true upheaval around politics often involve true upheaval with religion too. And that if you look at these, he, he looks at these three earlier times, that they do follow a sort of a format, maybe not a, an exact pattern, but they do, things fall apart in very similar ways, People begin asking very similar questions. Um, eventually, 
people begin to create new answers, and then those new answers become part of a new political and religious pattern that emerges on the other side of this long process of upheaval. So that's what I read in McLaughlin. He thought it was going on in the 70s, but Ronald Reagan was elected right after he wrote that paragraph. And uh, then I sort of realized, well, I guess you can stop awakenings from happening. That's uh, the question. <laughs> <laughs> and that seems to be what happened in 1980, is that whatever this hope was on the board, that people like who taught at Brown University could see and say in all seriousness from a book published by Chicago, University of Chicago Press, there was a different thing that occurred. And then I began to wonder, well, have we returned to the pattern? And when I wrote Christianity After Religion, Obama was newly elected. Um, and some of this kind of language was certainly showing up again. Um, in both the political and in the theological arena. So that's, what's so that's what I think is so interesting about what you're talking about in this book, about the way that awakenings work. And you talk a lot about sort of old lights and new lights, which makes sense, I guess, to historians of religion. I would more see it between as like dogmatism versus spirituality. Sorry, dogmatism versus romanticism or religion versus spirituality. And it always seems as though things are kind of going back and forth between these two poles. And um, I think you and I agree that there's a danger in going too far in either direction. It's not, I mean, if you, some, this sounds very nice. I mean, I, this to me sounds very idyllic. But I am also aware that certain religious movements, if they get a little bit too out there, can also become very dangerous. We were talking about, I don't know, like the Rajneeshis or, you know, so it, or what, what was the... Um, People's the, Temple. The, the, we, were the People's on, well, Temple. we were on the phone yeah. talking about if you get If you get a little bit too out there without the grounding that can come with the more religious side of things, things can kind of spin out in a dangerous way, just as if you have too much dogmatism, too much nativism, as you talk about, that can clamp things down on awakening as well. And so if, I mean, what, what basically it seems that you and maybe George McLaughlin, Mag sorry, not William McLaughlin, might have sort of seen is that there, there might have been these beginnings of awakenings happening, one at the end of the 70s and one about a decade ago, that were getting clamped by these sort of backlash movements that are kind of nativist movements, as you, as you call them in your book. And the question is, is there a way where more dogmatic and more romantic paths can walk hand in hand rather than constantly, you know, snuffing? You know, is, is there a way that this could have been integrated somehow without it getting snuffed? Do you see any way for that to work anyway, or because things are so polarized right now. Do you see the polarizing as part of awakening or as a shutting down of awakening? I think that the polarization um, is kind of, it, it's really part of the pattern that McLaughlin identifies about change around religion and politics. And when he looked back at the 18th century, the early 19th century, and then the late 19th century, to talk about what his, American historians sort of roughly refer to in sort of old-fashioned language now, the first, second, and third Great Awakenings. Um, he talked about how, you know, you have a, you have, have a situation where there's a certain kind of accepted institutions and accepted kinds of practices and accepted more or less norms in a culture. And those began to fray for whatever reason, immigration or different groups having new voice or economic change or what have you. Um, and so these circumstances begin to question that, that sort of institutional voice in the institutional life of, in this case, Christianity. And, and so what happens within uh, different kinds of Christian circles is people say, well, are we the guardians of the old way of doing things, or are we going to listen to all of these noisy voices around us 
and figure out a way of adapting, adjusting, or moving ahead. And so those two impulses have sometimes been referred to in the literature as old lights, the people who want to maintain the former thing, and new lights, the people who are listening to the new ideas and trying to gather up wisdom from that. And whenever that has happened in American history, it is huge splits. I mean, why are there 32,000 Christian denominations, many of them starting in the United States? It's because, and, and how many of them are Presbyterian? 40, 50, really? 80, <laughs> something like that. And then there's the Baptists. The Baptists and the Presbyterians are responsible for an enormous number of those. Um, and so, so you have this, this thing that just happens. And then McLaughlin and other people, certainly sociologists of religion talk about this, the argument happens and the culture changes and then something out of that emerges as kind of the new institutional life of religion and that relates to a new political, social, and economic environment. And so that's what he talks about. And so the, the question about now, and you, you ask about old lights and new lights, in my book I refer to uh, these two groups as the dogmatics and the romantics. This is very much a romantic yes. religious impulse. And I think that the, the language of dogmatics and romantics was more, ex it's a more explanatory device in a popular book um, when you're writing not towards the academy, but you're writing towards people who buy books in Barnes and Noble. And so I was, I avoided mostly the old new light, light language and went towards this other language, which I think is a little bit more narratively satisfactory. Um, and yet it, those two things don't answer the whole question. The question being, well, who stopped this? And who stopped this is a contemporary form of a nativist movement. And I blamed it a moment ago on Ronald Reagan. But if you think about the early 1980s, what we had in the early 1980s was sort of a, an upstart version of exactly what we're seeing today, white Christian nationalism, the, the fundamentalist modernist fight in the Southern Baptist Convention, how that really brought evangelical politics into the fore in the 1980s, and how white evangelical politics was all about, as uh, I think Randall Balmer has satisfactorily proved, was really primarily about race, and, and, um, and, and so we were, you know, sort of doing it all over again. And so we had this, this nativist movement in the 1980s, which was white evangelicals saying, we don't want the change. So it wasn't really the dogmatics versus the romantics. Those two groups are having kind of a fight about this, this slide. And meanwhile, a whole nother group enters into the scene and has a political, social, theological agenda and just basically stops the argument dead in its tracks and begins to sort of redirect the whole sort of discussion of, of faith and politics uh, because of the huge microphone they get in the culture, also the power that they begin to amass politically, which we all know is enormous. And that's happening again now. Right, and it is happening obviously. again. And um, I, I am just very interested in what, how that relates to this. This, when you see the Christians going down, is it, is it the death rattle? Or is, is there something about the, the religiously unaffiliated that are responding to that clamp down? And um, for my, I know that we also want to open it up to audience questions pretty soon, but I do have one more question for you that relates to this. In these religiously unaffiliated, you and I have talked about how even from here, there, there's still spiritual experiences. Um, Diana opens her most recent book, Freeing Jesus, with basically a description of a mystical experience, which um, I guess was inspired. Well, she was praying. I don't, you will have to get the book. Fortunately, it's just on the opening pages. But she talks about how when she was praying in the Washington National Cathedral, can I share this? I mean, I guess it's public. Yeah, I know, I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> 
um, she actually hears a voice saying, get me out of here. From this painting. Yeah. Um, and to me, that's also very much about Christianity and its future. It's, it's about, do we, is, is the right way forward in Christianity to free Jesus from these strict dogmatic rules and ways of being and open it up to more mystical possibilities. And for me, I, I'm interested in the possibility <clears throat> that that's going to come from the religiously unaffiliated. Right. And because those are rising. And you were, can you tell me about your view on that? Do you think that's possible? Well, this is... This is an area that gets me in a lot of trouble a lot of time on social media. I don't want to get you in trouble. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, the episode in the Washington National Cathedral, it actually happened in 2013, and I was praying in a chapel called the Chapel of the Holy Spirit, interestingly enough, um, with that big Jesus picture right behind the altar. So I'm kneeling on the altar rails. This big, gigantic Jesus is right in front of me. And I was, it was a complaining kind of prayer to God. I was <laughs> not in a good mood with God, so I was fussing. And uh, as I was doing this complaining sort of prayer, I suddenly heard this voice, and the voice said, get me out of here. And I looked around. There was no one else in the cathedral that I could see. So I went back to my praying, and a second time I heard a voice say, get me out of here. And at that point in time, I looked up at the picture, and I, I said, Jesus, it, is, is that you? <laughs> and a third time, I heard the same voice. You know, what is it? I'm a Christian. Three times you hear voices, you know, kind of thing. But I heard the voice third time say, get me out of here. At this point in time, I, I, I felt really freaked out. I looked down the main aisle of the cathedral, and there was an Episcopal priest coming down the aisle. And I thought, the last place I want to be is the Washington National Cathedral with an Episcopal priest and a talking Jesus. I, <laughs> I, I am so out of here. And I, so I bolted, kind of wondering, you know, what is this, you know? Um, what, what, I don't have any desire to steal a painting from the Washington National Cathedral, and why is Jesus telling me to get him out of here? Um, so despite the fact that I have been a public person and preached myriad sermons in the last uh, 10 years, I never told that story in public until I wrote this book. Uh, but I did tell my husband the day it happened, and he has always referred to this episode as that time that Jesus asked you to spring him from the slammer. <laughs> so it's worth noting that the Washington National Cathedral has not invited me to come and talk about this book. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. <laughs> but but the, the interesting thing is, you know, I love church. Much of my writing has been about strengthening communities, creating new vibrancy, helping Christians to understand change. So I'm not the kind of person who's going to sort of stand around and sort of open the doors in the back of the cathedral and say, oh, you fools, get out of here because you shouldn't be here in the first place. I really care um, about what the future of Christianity is. I would like to see it stay around um, in some way, shape, or form. I think that it is a life-giving path. And um, yet, what about this crazy episode? And I'm not entirely sure. I still even have it processed after writing a 300-page book. But what I think is fascinating is it almost doesn't matter that I heard Jesus say, get me out of here at the Washington National Cathedral almost 10 years ago, because in effect, all these people have been leaving Christianity anyway. Hmm. And that if, if uh, the Christian story and Christian churches are going to be, you know, with where people are, it's not anymore an expectation that people are going to come into buildings with nice gothic sort of stuff like this, but that in effect the church has to just leave in order to meet Jesus, I think, in the world. 
And so that's really, in effect, uh, where Freeing Jesus ends, telling the ironic story that most of that book was written during the pandemic. If anybody had tried to go into the Washington National Cathedral to meet Jesus in the church, they would have been greeted by locked doors mm. um, while I was writing the book. And so in a very real way, I wondered at the end of this particular piece if the pandemic had actually freed Jesus into the world in a very, um, uh, it, that it was a gift um, rather than a, a crisis. And um, yes, so those, the, the religious nuns, you know, it's as crazy to put all of the nuns in a single category. If I say, ever say, get, sit down with the people at Pew, I'm going to tell them this. It's as crazy to put all the nuns in the same category as it is to put all the Christians in the same category. Because the nuns include um, ex-evangelicals, post-religious people, humanists, folks who are completely secular, people who were born um, without any sort of religious background in their family traditions, uh, 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 spiritual but not religious people. There are so many different stories and so many different ways of conceptualizing um, a life of meaning in that none of the above category that with this kind of statistical analysis is going to have to come the beautiful fine tooth of narrative analysis to help us to understand the deep diversity that is within not only Christianity, and we're a little better at doing that than we used to be, um, but now it's going to have to be that same sort of, of analysis moving toward the people who are none of the above. So that category, because it holds so much, I think also needs to be looked toward as a category of incredible hope and meaning for the future. Yeah. So that's what I... To see that, it as a hopeful. To so, see somehow, the, instead of seeing that as dire, to see it somehow right. as hopeful. But I got to tell you, most um, executives in religious institutions see that as dire, um, mm -hmm. which is really... I spend an enormous amount of my life telling them to stop being in despair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it, it, it's, it's not all despair. It's difference. It's this, these pictures illustrate change, transformation, probabilities, possibilities, and challenge. Not just, a, not just despair. Thank you. I'd, I'd love to start opening it up. Okay. I have a quick question about what you were just saying. Are, are you saying then that the nuns are not really nuns, they're more seekers, and that's where the hope is, that they're seekers? Or? They're just a lot of different things. There are people in the nun category who are perfectly content being atheists, and they're never, they're, they're not gonna switch, change, uh, move, what have you, they're just gonna continue on that path. Um, the, the language of seeking, I think, is a little bit, um, I, I, I still remember Wade Clark Roof's famous book, A Generation of Seekers, where he sort of set up a paradigm that people who were out of religious institutions were always seeking meaning somewhere else. And I, I don't think the nuns are like that. I think that a lot of the nun category has um, been filled in by people who are angry. Uh, there, it, it, it's actually a, a big category of rejection. Um, they're really, we desperately need to know how many people in that category are folks who are ex-Roman Catholics who are so furious at the church that they want nothing to do with anything that resembles Christianity again, or they're just kind of mad at the church where they grew up. And they just don't want to go back to church, but they still sort of functionally think like Catholics or still have... Christian rituals at home or still celebrate holidays. We don't know that. That's not work people have done yet. And then the real big one. Oh my goodness gracious. Ex-evangelicals. I, 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 the next conference I'm speaking at is called Theology Beer Camp. It's, 
<laughs> and the, and theology, theology Beer Camp is basically 300 ex-evangelicals who are still interested in theology, spirituality, even church, uh, but who want nothing to do with the way that it currently exists. And so I don't know how those people ex describe themselves. You know, it, it, what would they tell a survey taker? So, so it's really, I mean, that's how much of a catch-all category it is. Anything we say about that category, there's going to be at least some other percentage of that category who contradicts what we say about it. So that's why I want that fine-tooth narrative comb inside of that category to start telling those stories better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, for me, when I hear and see this chart and today and uh, when I first saw it, the thing that surprised me is that people are surprised seeing from Europe how Christianity grew there, grew. And my country, Indonesia, an Asian, where people expect that Christianity will grow. And we see ex-evangelical also there. Some of my friends are. Maybe I am are. I am is. <laughs> uh, and like people thinking that, oh, youth are leaving the church, like the main line, the evangelical church for charismatic or Pentecostal movement. But no, they are also missing there. So my question is when seeing this thing and and talking to people in the dogmatic in old light camp, how can we help them to reimagine the mission, to enlarge the mission? Not only like keeping people in the church, adding people in the church, but mission that encompass so many things. Nature, yeah. reconciliation but also uh, fairness, purity, all those kind of things. How to reimagine mission with them, not with the evangelical. They already know how, <laughs> with the old camps. I think that's a really great question. And it's actually oh, a question that I find myself wrestling with. My, my, my work goes to so many different levels of this, and fairly recently I was with a group of denominational leaders from the upper Midwest in a particular mainline church. And one of the nice people, I, I, the mainliners still, the highest value is niceness. I'm really sorry if Stanley, is Stanley Howard was in the room? He always like would get angry at that. But um, <laughs> it still is the highest value for mainliners is to be nice. So they're really nice people. And uh, one of these nice church leaders uh, said to me, oh, it's so, it's so depressing. All of the young people have left church. They won't come back to church. We can't get them in the church. Instead, they go to the protest rallies. And I said, and you have a problem with that? <laughs> and they said, yeah, well, they're not in the church. They're, what's the protest rally got that we haven't gotten? I said, have you ever thought maybe that protest rally is kind of like the church to the young adults that you're talking about? And that they're, they're not maybe very interested in coming and singing old hymns, but that the, their, their work on the front lines of justice, that that's how they're understanding church? And literally, the person said to me, well, that couldn't be. <laughs> and I was just going, oh, my gosh, this has been 20 years I've been doing this. <laughs> Same questions keep coming up. But so what, what you said, I think, is real, you know, and, what, and really goes to Libby's question as well is that a lot of people who are in that none of the above category are finding really an expression of mission in something like a, a protest rally without necessarily having to be um, part of a traditional worshiping community. And then I explained to these nice folks that this doesn't mean that they hate traditional worshiping communities. They just haven't put these pieces together in a way that you recognize yet. And so how about we'll give 
new generation some space to try to figure this out. And it's the job of the people who are currently within the institution and committed to the institutions to figure out how to steward those institutions and resources toward a differently shaped future. And that got us to a kind of a new conversational space because I was trying to get them to let go of the idea that the future has to look just like the past in terms of the life of a congregation. Uh, but mission is a huge question. And it, it, it got me off on a, an incredibly fun riff. Uh, they asked me what I thought was the most successful mission um, that was any church was doing in the 21st century. And I said, well, it's not really a church, but I would say the most successful mission agency um, anywhere in the world right now is World Community Kitchen. And so I started talking about Jose Andres's work as essentially mission work. There's a theology of it. That is, the table can always be bigger. Yes. <laughs> it's a, he, Jose Andres has a Eucharistic theology at the center of World Community Kitchen. And it's a Eucharistic theology that's inclusive. And it's just like, it's, it's brilliant theologically, spiritually, every other way. He has, um, you know, resources that can be deployed. He actually has missionaries on the ground. Um, there's a, a discernible, that is hungry people in a state of crisis need to be fed. I mean, it's just amazing. And they thought, and, and so the people in this conversation were like going, I never really thought of that as mission. And, and I, I said, you know, this is the way that the 20th century, 21st century is calling us, is to not imagine sort of the, you know, Southern Baptist Convention mission board as mission, but to look around and see you know, that McLaughlin quote, which is really good, you know, <laughs> where that kind of stuff is happening in the world. And where stuff like that is happening, that's where we're finding an incredible amount of energy from a lot of different directions from people who don't know what to call themselves anymore. And so, so I love your question in so many ways. And if you ever want to come with me to an event and tell people that, from your mouth, I would be appreciative. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I want to keep on this uh, path about uh, why people who leave the church. Um, uh, I've worked for the last 40 some years with both clergy women, women who were active in the church and women who left the church usually because the church left them over an issue like maybe they were involved in sit-ins, maybe they were lesbian, maybe they were now trans, maybe they were abused by someone in the church. So people don't always leave Jesus when they leave the church. And um, uh, the other thing that occurred to me is that in the 80s, I said to a lot of women who had ministerial degrees and sometimes ordinations who couldn't find a job, I would say, what are you saying? There isn't ministry to be done in the world, which is what I hear you saying. The churches need to get in line with the ministry opportunities that are available in our communities and in the world if they want to stay in business. And the third thought I had is that this institution, not the part of it you were in, but the part of it that I was in when I was in seminary, uh, I mean, we're turning out professionals and they want jobs. And so the whole hierarchy panics because they're not going to be local churches to put them in. So I just thank you so much for opening this conversation up. I think there is a future, but if people insist on patriarchal language in Duke Chapel and in the Episcopal Church and that everybody be straight and married, you know, it's not going to have a future. So, Yeah, it's really... I. I it's a really interesting moment because on one hand, the idea of the conventional mission board doesn't work and you see something like World Community Kitchen or the pro or protest rallies or what have you in terms of social justice um, activism, Black Lives Matter that huge summer. 
um, you see all of that happening, and in effect, almost every person I know who is a Christian person was sort of out on the front lines of all of those things. Um, and so then you say, okay, well, that's where mission is going on, but how is that distinctive? You know, how does that relate to the story we bear about Jesus, the story we bear about um, death and resurrection, the story, we, this, the story we bear that is a distinctive story about loving our neighbors. And see, that's actually what I think the work of the church is. The, ch- the work of the church isn't going out and recreating a sort of a second-rate world community kitchen, because obviously uh, Jose Andres is doing that better than any church could possibly do. But the job of the church is to be in this sort of flow of the enlarging sphere of justice in the world, but also be reminding its own people that we're doing this story, uh, we're, we're doing these things in relationship to a story. And see, that's where I think the professional ministry comes into play. Is the, is the church should be reminding us of the the beautiful dimensions of the story we're bearing in that space, and so um, you know, for me, and I just did it actually. I don't think Jose Andres would sit here and say that he literally was enacting a Eucharistic theology in the streets of you know some city in Florida. Uh, but every time he talks about a table and feeding people, because I am a Christian, because I love theology, because I know those texts, I see that and I go, oh my gosh, that is Eucharistic theology on the streets. See, that's what the church needs to be doing. It needs to be shaping the imagination so that the, the, store, the, the way that the world unfolds justice, the way that the world is struggling towards equality, the way that the world is struggling toward, um, you know, all of the things that are challenging us, uh, creating new kinds of communities, dealing with climate change, all of that, all of that. Um, we can move there just because those things are meaningful and have to be tackled and have to be done or we can be moving there with these ancient stories, strengthening us, deepening us, helping us to be able to hold the course. Um, I'm sure some of you probably know this. Uh, Bill McKibben, you know, who is such a hero of mine. I mean, I'm, already, I'm listing Diana's heroes today. Um, Bill McKibben, who is a real hero of mine. Uh, I frequently ask Bill, you know, how do you do it? I say, I get depressed for working with churches that are in decline for 35 years, and, and they're, hard to, they're hard to cope with, but I don't have to deal with climate change and politicians all the time. You know, how do you even get up uh, in the morning with, with what you know we're facing? And you know what does it for him? His faith. He's a Christian. Grew up UCC in a liberal UCC church in New England. Was friends with Peter Gomes, who taught him the Bible when he was a student at Harvard. And he now goes to a teeny tiny little Methodist church up near Middlebury where he teaches in Vermont. And he said, you know, when I run out, when I can't do any more, it's all those stories and those experiences that echo in my heart and my mind and my soul. And all that just keeps me going. And so that's the piece for Christianity that I, you know, Jesus wasn't saying to me, you get out of here, don't pay any attention to me anymore. Jesus was saying, hey, Diana, let's run out into the world and and, and let's take this story there. And um, that's, that is, yeah, it's funny to sit here and say this, uh, but that's really my deepest um, heart and soul. You know, I have I have all this wonderful experience, this great gift that was given to me by the Duke Religion Department a long time ago, and um, the deepest thing that I am investing it in is trying to figure out how to keep the story of Jesus alive 
in our time, in our place, and to encourage others who want to share this story and teach this story and enact its rituals in the world, because I still think, even after all this time, that all of that matters, that it makes a difference to how we feed people, how we do justice, how we stand in, the, in and with the world in a time of tremendous challenge. Thank you. And did you hear the bells come? I it didn't occur to me when I planned this that the five o'clock chimes would happen yeah, at the time. end, and the, the timing was just perfect. Well, thank you, Diana. We're, we're out of time, but if you have more questions, we're gonna have a wonderful reception. Um, and so there'll be time to approach um, cause at, on the Divinity Terrace. So I hope you'll join us there. I know a lot more people had questions. So hopefully you'll join us there. I also wanted to just say that if you want to hear Diana preach, she's preaching at my church on Sunday at uh, the Church of the Holy Family, um, which is down on Brandon Road in Chapel Hill. And also she'll be back at Duke for Women's Weekend in February. So there's plenty more opportunities to hang out with Diana coming up, but the first one is right there on the terrace. There's also the bookstore, which has a few of her books, and they might be open for a couple more minutes. They're supposed to close at 5, but if you really want one of her books, you could run there right now and maybe get one. Um, so see you on the terrace. Thanks so much to everybody for coming, and thanks to Diana for this incredible conversation. <laughs>